get to our panel right now. David Collins teaches international economic law at City University of London. Also with us from London is Helen Thomas. She's the CEO and founder of Blonde Money, an economic consulting firm. Suzanne Lynch is the Washington correspondent for the Irish Times. And joining us from Paris is the co-founder of Le Monde Moderne, Alexi Poulin. Thanks to all of you for joining us. Uh, Helen Thomas, let me start with you. Theresa May has been crisscrossing the English Channel in the last few weeks, hoping to squeeze some kind of concession out of the European Union. There's another meeting that was held over the past 24 hours. Uh, she walked away empty-handed, but she's insisting that progress is still possible. Uh, is that realistic? Is she going to get anything out of the Europeans that she can sell back to her uh, backbench members in London? Well, what a week it has been for Theresa May. I mean, on Monday, you know, she had to pull the, the deal that, uh, you know, the vote that was supposed to take place in Parliament. And then only a couple of hours, a couple of days later, she actually managed to survive a leadership contest in her own uh, party confidence in her. So uh, in, a, in a way, she's, she's slightly got the momentum with her uh, from a very low point. But... It's very tricky right now. And of course, we have the holiday season upon us. She said today that the officials are going to keep working on things and keep trying to thrash out something that uh, might be positive to work through Parliament. I think the key thing, though, is we know now there is a significant number of rebels in her own party. We know the number. It's about one third of her MPs. So she's going to need something from the other MPs in Parliament. And actually, attention should start to shift to those other parties and those other MPs and exactly what it is that they're looking for. OK, let's go to Paris, to Alexis Poulain. Uh, Alexis, these negotiations have been going on for a long time. Uh, this is what the European Commission President, Jean-Claude Juncker, said in Brussels on Friday this morning. Let's watch. A second after an approval by the two parliaments, the British one and the European one, and before signature, we'll start the negotiations on the future relations, because I was following, second by second, the debate in the House of Commons, and I noted that there is a deep mistrust in the House when it comes to the European Union. That's not a good basis for future relations. Alexei, does it seem to you like the European Union is playing hardball with Theresa May here? They're not giving her an inch. Uh, and what about the point that Jean-Claude Juncker made there about the uh, British Parliament uh, not having a good uh, relationship with the European Union? Is there bad blood between the British and the EU? Well, it's always been the case. I mean, if you remember, uh, during um, Mrs. Thatcher, uh, it was all about, uh, I want my money back rent, saying that uh, the EU costs too much to uh, the British taxpayers compared to what they get. Uh, and clearly, this Brexit affair all started because the Tory party, the Conservative, is very divided about the Europe and the European Union. Uh, you have uh, pro and cons. And, and this divide in the party is actually killing both the party, but also also uh, the future and jeopardize the future of the UK in the EU. I don't think uh, actually uh, European Union is playing tough. Uh, they're being honest and open, saying don't try to negotiate with the 27. The deal is between Brussels, the 27, and, and you. And we'll have to negotiate this way and not one by one. And of course, uh, we know that there are issues about uh, Gibraltar, uh, about fisheries, of course, Ireland, uh, and others. But uh, Basically, Brexit deal was put on the table, not the deal, but the vote, the referendum, uh, by David Cameron at a time where he wanted to have an uncontested leadership of the Tory party. And this is where we are now, with a very weak party and uh, with uh, Britain not being in a good position, actually, to bargain and get more from uh, its, part its partner in the European Union. Suzanne, the Republic of Ireland is the only country in the European Union that has a land border with uh 
the United Kingdom. That border, of course, separates the Republic of Ireland from Northern Ireland. And at the heart of this current dispute that we're hearing about in Parliament in London is the status of that border. Why is it so important? Yes, this has emerged as the crucial issue that could bring down a Brexit deal, in fact. Um, and I don't think anyone saw it, saw it, predicted that it would become this prominent in the debate. But the Irish government, when Britain, Britain voted to leave, made a strategic decision to make sure that the border, the Northern Ireland issue, was dealt with first and foremost. And that was, you know, that was backed by the, the European partners who wanted to protect um, its territory, but also ensure that there was no hard border in the island of Ireland, because everyone remembers that that really was there and symbolized a time of awful violence in Ireland that people have moved on yeah. from. But I do think now the government in Ireland has taken a risk. It, it could be a diplomatic triumph. If, if, this, if this gets done, if there is a, a soft enough Brexit, which Ireland wants, and there is no border, it's a huge triumph. But now, I think people are beginning to get worried that now we could be heading perhaps for a no-deal Brexit. Uh, the Irish government said this week that it's preparing its own preparations for a no-deal Brexit. Um, so if, in fact, we do see Britain exiting the European Union without a deal, this will be, this will have backfired in a sense on the Irish government yeah. because Ireland is by far, the Republic of Ireland, apart from the border, border issue is the most exposed economically to Britain leaving the European Union. It's got a lot of close uh, ties in terms of trade as well as political perspectives. Yeah. So I think it's a very dangerous moment at the moment for the, for the Irish government as well as the government in Westminster. Just one point, Suzanne. If there is no deal, uh, would that make it likely that there would be a hard border? Well, yes, because it, the problem is that Britain will no longer be in the European Customs Union, yeah, yeah. No, no longer be in the single market, and yeah. to police that in terms of the movement of goods and people, you would need a border. Right. But nobody wants that for political reasons that are linked with the conflict that went on there for so many years. Okay, let me bring in David Collins. He's in London as well. David Collins, there is a new term we're hearing now. It's called the backstop. And it's the measure to keep that border between the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland open. This is what Theresa May, the British Prime Minister, said about the backstop. Let's watch this. If the backstop was ever triggered, it would apply only temporarily, and the EU would use its best endeavours to negotiate and conclude expeditiously a subsequent agreement that would replace the backstop. That the EU stands ready to embark on preparations so that negotiations on the future partnership can start as soon as possible. As formal conclusions, these commitments have legal status and therefore should be welcomed. So David Collins, as you listen to Theresa May there, does that sound like a bit of a band-aid solution that, you know, we'll do what we can right now and maybe we'll fix it later? Yes, absolutely. In fact, it's worse than that. It, it's misleading. It makes it seem like the backstop is only an option, uh, an alternative that might not happen. But of course, based on the terms of the withdrawal agreement, it was almost a certainty because the only thing that would preclude the backstop from taking place would in fact be a trade agreement which in the political declaration was described as being uh, like a customs union. So unless effectively we stay in the customs union, then the backstop is triggered. And we know, of course, that the customs union was not what was voted for in the referendum. So it's really quite circular and, and misleading, and uh, it's not helpful to anybody. And it, it would really uh, it ultimately carve off Northern Ireland from the, the rest of uh, Great Britain, and, and that's just not acceptable. Just help us understand this, David, because one of the uh, complaints we're hearing from critics of this deal is that that forces Britain to comply with the European Union rules uh, in which it has no say at all. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. Uh, the withdrawal agreement lasts until the end of 2020, during which time the UK essentially stays inside the European Union how those rules are formed. This is a shocking state of affairs. To be governed by a, a foreign government, a foreign court, with no role of participating in, in those institutions is really unprecedented in, in modern history, especially for a country as, as large as the UK. And, uh, of course, at the end of this period, we have the potentially indefinite backstop arrangement, which is even worse because, as I said earlier, it, it could potentially carve off Northern Ireland from the rest of the United Kingdom. So separating the, the country in half and leaving Northern Ireland uh, as a province of the EU, uh, unacceptable to the British public and obviously to Parliament as well. I mean, there's a few points on that just to say one of the difficulties for Theresa May is that while England voted overwhelmingly 
uh, to, you know, while, while certain parts of the, the yeah. union voted in one way, Northern Ireland voted to stay in the European yeah. Union. So a lot of people, and most people in Northern Ireland, in fact, wants to stay with the European Union. Yeah. But you're right, um, I mean, this issue of Northern Ireland now, the reason it's become such an issue right. is because the unions, the DUP, are propping up Theresa May's government. She mm -hmm. needs them for support, so she has to listen to them. Some people would, would be suspicious and say, actually, if the DUP didn't have that leverage, you know, how committed would Britain really be on the backstop issue? And uh, so if we get to, into a situation where there's a new government, a new general election, for example, and the DUP yeah. don't have that power, maybe we might see Britain prepared to compromise a bit more on the backstop. And the people of Scotland also voted overwhelmingly to stay. And of course, this is one of the ironies again. Northern yeah. Ireland, in one sense, in terms of pure economics, and mm. I accept the political situation is different, in pure economic terms, was getting the best possible deal in this right. arrangement because they would still be kind of in the EU and kind of in Britain. And actually, I've been talking to a lot of Scottish people, Scottish people here in Washington, who actually would be very envious of that. They also wanted to stay in the European Union. So, you know, as Richard said at the beginning, there's a whole constitutional issue for the United Kingdom, the different parts of the United Kingdom right. that has to be worked out uh, in this Brexit agreement. All right, let me go back to Helen Thomas. Helen, uh, you were talking a moment ago about the possibility of of Theresa May turning to other parties. There was an opinion piece in today's Financial Times, Friday's Financial Times, which says the Prime Minister either loses or she makes a pact with the opposition Labour Party in Britain to remain in some kind of European economic area or she calls a second referendum. I mean, are those realistic options for Theresa May? She would, of course, have to get the support of the Labour Party. At this point, and given what she faces in Parliament, I would put nothing off the table. And that is what is making, obviously, quite a difficult environment, particularly from a business and investment perspective, given that we could go in any one of a number of different directions. And, of course, the commentary that you hear, people tend to come to it from their own particular perspective on what might be rational and um, that could be purely an economic question. I think Suzanne was saying there it's not always about the economics. It's an identity type question as well. So where we're now left in terms of people talking about elections or a second referendum, those are mechanisms to break the deadlock. But at the end of the day, um, we are in a default position where Article 50 has been triggered and we must leave on the 29th of March 2019, which means that if nothing happens, if, if no agreement can be reached, then we are headed for that no-deal situation that you know some other people have been talking about this evening. And that means that if you're going to stop no deal, you have to come up with a majority for something else. Right. And at this moment in time, with only 10 to 12 weeks to go, we don't have that majority at this stage. Alexei, do you see some way in which Britain could maintain some kind of relationship with the European Union, uh, but not be a full member of it? Well, that, that's, well that, that's the, the old, old uh, idea about the deal uh, that Theresa May wants to bring home is, is having uh, the best of both worlds. Uh, but it seems very difficult so far uh, because of all this uh, borders issue and all of the free movement of people and goods. Uh, so um, I, I, I don't know what's going to be best for uh, the British people out of this deal. And that's the main question that should be asked is, what do we get if we get no deal? What do we get if we get a deal? And, and where do we go next? Um, what will be the sort of relationship that the UK will have uh, with Europe? Of course, it will keep on being a strong relationship, uh, be it with the economy, with the people going from country to country. Uh, this will not change uh, overnight. Of course not. Uh, the main question is about finding the best deals, because it's going to take time to renegotiate uh, some trade deals uh, country by country and with bigger countries. And with We've seen already uh, ministers and uh, the British government trying to uh, go around in the Commonwealth and meeting other countries to try to prepare and get other uh, trade deals with uh, other regions than, than Europe. So we'll have to, to wait and see for this. David Collins, there was an interview on a British television network uh, last night on Thursday night. It was with the former British Deputy Prime Minister Michael Heseltine, he's a member of the Conservative Party, I think he served in the uh, Margaret Thatcher government, and he said what is going on right now means that Britain is giving up power, giving up its voice in Europe, 
And not only that, he says that the future for young Britons, for young people in Britain, is very bleak because of Brexit. Uh, do you agree with that? I watched that interview. I know exactly what you're referring to. I disagree with it entirely. I think the future of the world is not in Europe. The future of the world is globally, especially Asia. And I think young people will begin to realize that as they start to mature and realize uh, where opportunities lie. And they're not necessarily in the EU. So I think that's a very misguided, outdated viewpoint. And there's absolutely no reason that the United Kingdom cannot continue to engage with the EU without being part of the EU. You can have a free trade agreement very easily that would have trade it would, uh, in, in goods, it would have trade in services, it would have opportunities f for workers to, to, to go to the EU or for EU workers to come here under certain circumstances. So this idea that we're somehow turning our back on the EU and this is going to punish a generation is just another example of this really over-emotional provocative language that, that's uh, it frustrated the rationality behind uh, what's really is the right decision. Suzanne, you were telling us earlier on of the risks that uh, the Irish government faces right now. But what is the Irish government's position on perhaps renegotiating this, perhaps making some kind of concession? Yeah, I think what we saw today was the Irish government actually did not make much of a concession. Leo Varadkar, the Taoiseach, said, you know, we, we have spent two and a half years negotiating. This is the final agreement. Yeah. And they're worried about having, as we talked about earlier, a time frame on this that actually you know, if we're waiting until a future trade deal is negotiated, everyone knows that can go on for decades. Look what mm -hmm. happens with TTIP. The US-EU trade will never happen. Yeah. You know, so that is why Ireland wants to protect its interests in that, in that way. Um, but I think the biggest problem, and from hearing people who are in the room in Brussels, was that the EU leaders wanted to give Theresa May something, but they felt that she, there, there is no backing for her from either side in Britain. They feel that no matter what they give her, she's not going to be able to, to sell that to our parliament, because we've got people, the Brexiteers, who will never really be happy with any, any deal she's going to come back with, and then you have people who want to stay who are not happy either. So she has ended up in a situation where nobody is happy with the agreement she has uh, secured. And even if there are tweaks, I think the Euro on the European side believe, well, there's no point in offering something else, because this is just not going to get the backing from parliament. And she should have known this mm -hmm. before getting to this point. And over the next few months, there's nothing much more they can do. Um, so I think it's very much the ball now is in uh, the court in, in, in Westminster's court, and as some of the other contributors were saying here, I think the, the focus now will be on the Labour Party. What do they think? You know, we know that Jeremy Corbyn is secretly, in a, for very different reasons, sceptical of the EU. Um, but the fact that there's no major opposition in Britain to give voice to a pro-EU sentiment, a truly pro-EU sentiment, I think has been a very interesting um, aspect of this. And I think now focus is going to turn on what does Labour want to do, what kind of um, platform would they go to the country on. And I think that might dictate uh, the debate in the next few weeks in London and may ultimately dictate where this goes. Right, so then, just for the sake of argument, if mm -hmm. the EU said, look, tell us what you want uh, that you can take back to win over your party, mm -hmm. what could she ask for? Well, she could say what she wants is to keep, in, to keep the benefits, to, have right. her, to keep all the benefits of the right. European Union. Can we have access to all the funds, but we don't want to do, do single, uh, free movement. Right. And that has been the debate, how much, how much are they prepared to give on immigration to get economic um, proximity to Europe? Okay. Helen, uh, what is the impact of all of this on domestic British politics? I mean, there is, we see, a very deep division in the Conservative Party. Could it split that party? Uh, we already know that the Prime Minister has said that she will not be leading the party into the next general election. Well, I think it already has, even if not on a completely official basis. And one thing I'm going to look out for in the next few weeks is, although she survived that leadership challenge, there are these very strong feelings, as Suzanne was just saying, between people who strongly just want to walk away and pay nothing to the EU on a no-deal kind of basis. But there's also some Remainers, uh, people who want a second referendum even. And there's a risk actually, that although Theresa May survived that vote, that those people ideologically have such a strong opinion and feel that the clock is ticking, they could even stand as independents within the parliament and resign the Conservative Party whip to try and get their uh, opinion across. And then what then would become very interesting is the Labour Party and whether uh, some of their more ideological uh, base could start to split off from the Jeremy Corbyn angle um, to all of this. But even then, I mean, we were running the numbers today. 
then you can look at all the different combinations of a Norway type deal or a Canada deal or a second referendum. However you cut it and slice it and dice it, the country and the parliament is absolutely split down the middle. And there is a risk, whatever happens with this, that the UK political system is quite frankly broken and we need a realignment of parties or of people in the next few months and years ahead. David Collins, one of the options that Helen just mentioned is a second referendum. I mean, what are the chances of a second referendum? I think it's very unlikely, and I think there's actually very little support for it in the British public. I think it's only a minority of public is remotely interested in it. It's just that some high-profile celebrities and former politicians have been pushing it for some time, and that's why it, the media has focused on it. I think if there was a second referendum, there would be another leave vote. And in fact, the leave vote would probably by be an even larger margin than it was originally. And one of the reasons for that is I think some of the people that voted remain would now uh, vote leave on principle because they would feel insulted that they were being asked again uh, to, to make a decision that had been democratically done uh, previously. And uh, I, I think the other issue, of course, is, uh, again, what would the, one of the big debates is what would the option be on the ballot? And now it's looking like, like it would be something along the lines of staying in the EU now that we know that Article 50 uh, can be revoked, or perhaps leaving with a no deal, or perhaps leaving with Theresa May's deal. And given that no one wants her deal, I think you would be no deal versus stay in, and the, the, the British public, I think, would go for no deal. Alexei, uh, if we look at the view from Europe, and this is a view of a far-right populist party in Germany, the alternative for Germany, uh, it says that the present deal is meant to punish Britain for leaving the European Union. Is there something to that, punishing Britain? No, no. Uh, no, this is the nationalist rant, of course, saying that the EU is the origin of all uh, the misery of, of the people of Europe. It, it's wrong. Uh, I, I, of course, the, a lot of things need to be changed uh, in the way the current European Union has been uh, working and has been building itself. Uh, but you can't say that it's a punitive approach. I think uh, Michel Barnier, who's been uh, manning the, the Brexit team, uh, and, and all the partners have been trying to work very closely with the British government. Uh, and if you look the way it worked, it's the Brexit minister who left and we were not very uh, working hard on the deal uh, compared to uh, the EU technocrats that right. were trying to put it on the table. Uh, so we can't talk about punition here. Uh, everybody is trying to get the best deal because Europe needs the UK as much as the UK needs a strong relationship with uh, the continent. Okay, and that's where we have to leave it. Thanks to all of you for being with us. That's it for this edition of The Heat. As the conversation continues online, join us on CGT and America's Facebook page to comment on this or any other show or chat with us on Twitter at CGT and America. I'm Arnold Nidum in Washington, D.C. Thanks for being with us.